What I would like uh, to do uh, in this talk is to describe uh, quite funny uh, physics uh, that uh, is possible in bilayer graphene at a pretty low energy scale of several uh, electron volts uh, in terms of uh, the electron excitation energies or Fermi level uh, in bilayer graphene counted from the Dirac point. Uh, so what I'll do in this talk, I'll start with uh, an introduction uh, and I'll uh, have the uh, road built from the uh, high energy description of the electrons uh, using the tie binding model down to uh, two events which uh, may happen, or I think they do happen, uh, in bilayers. Uh, this is the Lifshitz transition in the electronic band structure, uh, which consists in the change of the topology uh, of, the, uh, of the electron Fermi surface, uh, which can be controlled and uh, stimulated by uh, strain in bilayers. And second, uh, I'll uh, describe an alternative which results in exactly the same change in the band structure, which consists in the phase transition in the electronic liquid uh, itself. And uh, the uh, order in which uh, I'll describe this, uh, uh, this two effects, uh, it's not in the, the order in which we uh, actually uh, published our work. Uh, we first uh, understood the behavior of electrons in ideal pristine unperturbed by layer, and after we found that uh, the, there is a plausible phase transition into the so-called pneumatic phase, uh, we uh, looked at uh, a, uh, the effect of the strain uh, on uh, bilayers because to achieve uh, such a regime where this phase transition uh, would take place, one has to uh, work with very clean material with very high controllable uh, carrier density to reach uh, low energy scale for the Fermi level and uh, therefore one has to work with uh, suspended flakes. And when you suspend the flake, uh, you have to start worrying immediately about how much strain has been imposed on this uh, few atoms in membrane uh, when it is lying on some massive contacts and if contacts have moved then uh, you should uh, expect that there will be a little bit of strain uh, acting in uh, graphene. So I'll start uh, from uh, a big picture, uh, starting from a single layer, and uh, I need to do that to introduce the language and notations uh, that will be used uh, in the rest of the talk. So here we have the uh, corner of the brilliant zone, the part of the, uh, of the momentum space we're interested in the properties of the electrons. Uh, we have the Honeycomb lattice, and we have the uh, A, B hopping, uh, which is the main uh, hopping uh, that uh, determines the band structure uh, of electrons. Uh, when we look at the uh, hopping from the sublattice A into sublattice B atoms, for each atom A, we have three B atoms surrounding it. And the block states in the corner of the brilliant zone have such, uh, have such uh, uh, wave vectors that uh, the phase uh, of the block state on the three sides surrounding, on the three sides surrounding uh, single, uh, three B sides surrounding A site, uh, the uh, sum of these three phases is equal to zero. And uh, as a result, uh, in the uh, two by two Hamiltonian, which describes uh, the uh, dispersion of the electrons in the vicinity of the brilliant zone corner, uh, the uh, hopping element gamma node itself cancels out. It only appears together with uh, the uh, momentum uh, the valley momentum counted from the brilliant zone corner, uh, which appears through the expansion of the phase factors uh, in a small parameter, the momentum multiplied by the lattice constant. So then you get uh, the two by two Hamiltonian, which has this form of the Dirac Hamiltonian. And uh, I'll use for uh, simplicity, for, for, for uh, uh, not really simplicity, but for compactness, uh, the notation uh, this is not number pi, it is an operator. It is a sum of uh, x uh, and i, y components uh, of the electron momentum. Uh, so now we have uh, the Hamiltonian, which describes how the plane waves, how the uh, Bloch plane waves 
uh, on the sublattice A and sublattice B of a single layer are coupled. And uh, this gives the linear dispersion of those Dirac cones close to the Brillouin cone. Uh, now we take uh, two layers, uh, and uh, according to what's known about graphite, we have to arrange them uh, into the Bernal stacking. Uh, we uh, have to consider the uh, uh, arrangements of atoms that uh, a pair of atoms in the two layers sit on the top of each other, whereas for the other pair, uh, the uh, uh, middle of hexagon is above the atom, and uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, other atom in the uh, top layer is just uh, above the middle of hexagon in the bottom layer. And then uh, we need to take into account the interlayer hopping, uh, which uh, in the first instance we can introduce as the hopping between the two atoms which uh, are uh, on the top of each other. This is the parameter gamma 1 according to slanchevsky weiss McClure parameterization. And then we build up the 4x4 four four Hamiltonian. Now it is 4x4 four four because we have now not two but four atoms in the unit cell of the bilayer. And uh, uh, we arrange the amplitudes of the electronic wave functions on the block functions uh, on the uh, sublattices in such a way that the pair of sublattices which appear on the top of each other appear here in one corner, and the pair of sublattices which uh, appear not on the top of each other, which appear on the top of or uh, under the middle of the hexagon in the other layer, uh, they are collected in the top part of the four component spinner. Then after we do that and uh, confine ourselves to the corner of the brilliant zone uh, of graphene only, then the intra-layer hopping of the electrons uh, is now described by this uh, uh, pi and pi dagger operators, uh, which uh, operate within uh, each of the layers separately, and uh, the interlayer coupling is provided by this gamma one hopping, which appears in its full glory, not in the form of uh, parameter multiplied by the small value of the momentum. So when we diagonalize uh, this Hamiltonian, we get this uh, band structure with four bands in the Brillouin corner, uh, where two bands are split apart. So these are the bands based on the atoms which are sitting on the top of each other. And uh, there are two bands which touch each other. These are the bands, uh, also parabolic bands, uh, which, uh, which correspond to the uh, electronic wave functions, uh, which are mostly reside on the atoms uh, which uh, uh, do not find the closest neighbors above or below in the other layer. And then we can just concentrate on this low energy part of the electronic band structure. The energy scale uh, less than uh, 0.4 uh, electron volts, which is the value of gamma 1. And at this energy scale, we only have two bands. And for the energy uh, close to the uh, neutrality condition, uh, we can simplify the description uh, just looking on the two bands only. And this would be described in terms of the 2 by 2 Hamiltonian, uh, which is now quadratic. It's similar to the monolayer Hamiltonian in terms of its structure, except that in the off-diagonal parts uh, describing the coupling of the sublattices, uh, now only two sublattices, not all four. And this happens after we eliminate uh, the high energy part of the Hamiltonian by, uh, by schrieffer wolf transformation. Uh, we get uh, this uh, quadratic pi dagger and uh, square and pi square operators. And now we have also the uh, parabolic uh, dispersion, which uh, is characterized by an effective mass, which is about half of the effective mass of electrons in gallium arsenide. Uh, this also can be transformed into information about Landau levels. And I would like you to remember uh, about the counting, which is uh, summarized uh, in this transparency, uh, I, I, I like you to remember it until uh, the end of the talk because I'm going to use it. Uh, if we have a monolayer uh, where we have the Dirac spectrum, then for the Dirac spectrum, uh, we have always one single Landau level at zero energy. But when we count the, uh, and, and this is exactly at zero energy, and then if we count the uh, discrete uh, degeneracies which uh, appear in the system, uh, which uh, uh, take, has to take into account the electron spin and the existence of the second of two valleys, uh, then each of the zero energy Landau levels uh, for uh, the monolayer, and I now say for the single Dirac cone uh, in terms of the dispersion, uh, gives us the fourfold degenerate zero energy Landau level. If we take the bilayer, 
then at zero energy we'll have an additional degeneracy so that for the bilayer uh, we'll have the eightfold uh, degenerate Landau level at zero energy. So the rule is the following. If we have the Hamiltonian where uh, we have kind of chirality uh, in this uh, building this Hamiltonian, which is one, uh, we have fourfold degenerate Landau level at zero energy. If chirality is doubled, uh, like we have in the bilayer, uh, we have the, uh, the eightfold degenerate uh, zero energy Landau level. All other Landau levels in the spectrum, uh, they are fourfold degenerate, both in the monolayer and in the bilayer. And uh, in the monolayer, uh, the spacing between levels is such that the largest separation is between uh, the zeros and the next one. And the rule of engagement is that uh, the, uh, the magnetic field dependence is a square root dependence on the magnetic field. And then the energy levels become denser and denser when you go up on the energy scale. Whereas in the uh, bilayer, the dispersion of Landau, the fan plot, uh, looks very similar to what you have in usual semiconductors. Uh, at high Landau level numbers, uh, it's almost uh, uh, linear in the uh, number of the Landau level, and uh, it is also linear in the magnetic field. Now I'm going down to the low energy scales. And at low energy scales, which uh, would correspond to that, I would also be interested in Landau levels at uh, relatively small magnetic fields. I have to be more cautious, and I have to take into account smaller effects which may appear due to uh, couplings which have been ignored in, in the previous uh, consideration. So the, the, the coupling that now has to be looked at in more details is the coupling between the atoms which uh, were sublattice uh, uh, block states which do not appear on the top of each other. This is uh, described by the parameter gamma 3 in terms of Slazhensky wise parameterization. So what does this uh, gamma 3 do? Uh, if you look uh, at the bilayer uh, uh, bi lattice from the top and realize that uh, this double site in the middle is now excluded from the consideration because it supports the split band states but it does not su uh, support the uh, the uh, lower energy bands that uh, we discussed in the previous few slides, uh, then uh, the lattice that you will see will be exactly like the honeycomb lattice of the monolayer. And the coupling uh, gamma 3 on this lattice is very similar to the coupling of uh, uh, gamma, one, uh, gamma node uh, on, uh, on a single layer. So that its effect uh, for uh, the two uh, sublattice states that now are uh, relevant for the low energy band structure will be exactly the same as the effect of gamma node coupling was uh, in the monolayer. The gamma 3 itself will disappear and it will only enter as uh, the prefactor in front of the uh, momentum uh, which uh, uh, appears after we take into account that the block states on the a sublattices and the block states on B sublattices have this rule of the phases that if we take any of these uh, A atoms in one layer and look at three B tilde atoms in the other layer, the amplitudes of the block functions on this B tilde sites uh, will sum uh, together to zero uh, exactly in the Brillouin zone corner. And only uh, what's left uh, will be proportional to the small value of the electron momentum counted from the Brillouin zone corner. That's why in this part we now get not gamma 3 itself, but we get the much smaller uh, contribution, which is V3 pi. Uh, uh, V3 is determined, uh, is related to uh, gamma 3 in the same way as Dirac velocity is related to the intralayer hopping uh, in a single layer. And then what we need to do, we just need to incorporate this into the uh, two by two Hamiltonian describing the low energy electrons. And then we can draw the, the uh, sketches of the band structure which are shown here. So at the large energy scale, the band structure has this two split bands and then two parabolic bands which touch each other uh, in the Brillouin zone corner. Very close to this Brillouin zone corner, uh, the parabolic dispersion is already violated. It's violated by the linear term which now appears in the Hamiltonian. This term is permitted by the symmetry and therefore it is prescribed in principle to be included. And then even more importantly, at small momenta, the linear term becomes as important as quadratic. And this is reflected by the drastic change in the band structure which takes place uh, in the small momentum uh, interval around the uh, corner of the Brillouin zone. 
Now, what you see here is that if you start cutting the bends uh, through at a fixed energy, so we can say we vary the carrier density in graphene and follow the change uh, in the shape of the uh, Fermi circle, it becomes less and less similar to a circle. It becomes triangulated. So this is why uh, the combination of these terms is called the trigonal warping, uh, causes trigonal warping uh, of the band structure. And even more, after some uh, critical uh, energy scale, uh, the uh, topology of uh, the Fermi line changes because now what you see is that at smaller energies, the, uh, the dispersion splits into separate Dirac cones, actually four of them, one in the middle and three offside. The three offside are asymmetric. The one in the middle is symmetric. And if you make uh, energy cuts uh, at different values of energies, these are the constant energy lines. This one, the bigger one, is at higher energy, and the four pieces now separated correspond to a, a much smaller energy. The change in the topology of the band structure we estimated uh, happens at the energy of about one uh, milli electron volt. Uh, to do that, we, to make this estimate, we took parameters uh, which uh, are known for bulk graphite. Uh, there is no reason why they should be exactly the same in bilayer graphene because let's just uh, period is slightly, uh, the distance between layers is slightly different than it is in bulk graphite. But nevertheless, uh, that's the best uh, we can do to estimate. And uh, in terms of at what uh, density such change in the band structure in, in the topology of the Fermi line would happen, we can convert this into the concentration of electrons of carriers in, in graphene, uh, electrons or holes. Uh, and what you see here is relatively small, 10 to the 10 inverse square centimeter density uh, uh, where it happens. So it means that if you want to see something of this sort, the change in topology of the band structure, you have to be able to control the carrier density in graphene uh, with a very high precision. And this is possible only if one works uh, with suspended layers. Uh, so this kind of uh, change in the band structure is called Lifshitz transition. It was uh, discussed in quite a lot of details uh, in uh, the physics of bulk metals. Uh, and uh, this uh, material uh, offers us a possibility uh, to work uh, with the system where many things can be changed. In bulk metal, you would struggle to change carrier density to uh, to large amount, and therefore changing the topology of the band structure by changing the density, like we can do it in graphene, uh, would be quite difficult. In graphene, it's doable. Uh, the last thing uh, I would like to. Uh, 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 mentioned before I go into the physics of strains, uh, it is that now we can put on a magnetic field and we can look at the spectrum of Landau levels, which is shown here. Uh, so what is shown on this plot is how the Landau levels evolve when you go from the strong fields down to the weak fields. So what you see here at strong fields is that the fan plot with Landau levels which depend linearly on the magnetic field at high fields, there is the eightfold degenerate Landau level at exactly zero energy. And then at some uh, relatively small range of magnetic fields, uh, the effect called magnetic breakdown takes place. Actually, two Landau levels come very close to each other to zero energy. And then the Landau level, uh, which was eightfold degenerate at high fields, becomes uh, Landau level, which is 16-fold degenerate at the low fields. Why is that? Uh, it is because now we have four Dirac cones in the spectrum at low energies. And uh, if magnetic field is small, then it means the inverse of magnetic length is also very small. And therefore, the formation of Landau levels involves states in each uh, pieces of the dispersions separately, in each of these Dirac cones separately. And each of the Dirac cones provides us four Lando levels. There are four Dirac cones now at low energies in the spectrum. Therefore, we'll have 16 Lando levels at zero energy. What it would mean in terms of quantum Hall effect or Shubnik of the gas oscillations, it would mean that filling factor eight uh, would be the one which persists down to the lowest magnetic fields, whereas all the other filling factors, filling factor four, filling factor 12, and, and 16 and so on would very quickly disappear simply because they would have much smaller, the, uh, much smaller activation energy. So now uh, uh, about suspended graphene and about uh, the regimes when one would expect the Lifshitz transition uh, to take place. You want to work with low densities, therefore you want to have very clean structure, very homogeneous uh, carrier density. 
And for that, suspended graphene is the best, as has been shown by uh, a number of groups by now. And uh, as I said, uh, this is a situation when you have to start worrying about other past, not the inhomogeneity, but strain. You put uh, a flake uh, onto a suspension, and then if anything moves in your device, uh, you start uh, deforming graphene a little bit. And what we want to understand is what effect even the simplest uh, variation of strain, uh, in the simplest version of strain, homogeneous strain, would have on the electron band structure at such small energy scale. So how do we envisage strain? Uh, so the flake has moved, uh, has deformed a little bit, uh, so that the lattice of graphene has rescaled in both layers. In principle, we can permit a little bit of shear between the uh, two uh, layers, uh, but uh, the uh, most interesting uh, part is, well, uh, equally interesting part, or uh, I would say most interesting part, uh, is coming from, uh, from the uh, strain effect uh, in each uh, layer, uh, 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 so that uh, the, uh, the strain affects uh, the, uh, the each of the layers separately, or together, sorry, together. So what, uh, what is the effect of the strain? Uh, if the effect of the strain consists in that now the parameters gamma node and gamma 3 uh, are no more the same uh, for three directions of the electron hole. So that if we take gamma 3, for example, uh, and look at uh, the uh, hopping between uh, the uh, two layers uh, in three directions, so from A atom into surrounding three B atoms, uh, then this hopping elements due to, the, uh, due to the deformations of the lattice are no more equal. And because they're no more equal, the cancellation that uh, we discussed earlier does not happen. And as a result, there will be contribution towards the electronic Hamiltonian, which is proportional to the strain, and it is proportional to the parameter gamma 3 itself. This is the same thing as known uh, in, uh, in the monolayer, where the same effect is produced by the uh, lack of the cancellation between three terms, which are proportional to gamma nu. This is not the only effect of the strain we have to worry about, but uh, there is one trivial which can be uh, easily uh, eliminated. Uh, when we strain the structure, the K points in the brilliant zone, uh, they also have to be moved. So that's the first thing we do. Uh, we first take into account the, the shape of the brilliant zone changes. And then in the corner of the recalculated brilliant zone, we do the uh, expansion of the Hamiltonian uh, into the uh, sublattice components. So what do we have? We have a four by four matrix. Uh, this part, the interlayer coupling of the two sides which are sitting on the top of each other, uh, we don't change it here, but we can take into account the variation of this parameter upon strain. It does not lead to any qualitative change uh, in the Hamiltonian structure. The off diagonal the anti-diagonal part on this Hamiltonian, which describes the intralayer hopping, is now affected by that the cancellation between hops in three directions is no more happening, so that we get a constant term which is proportional to the strain, and it's also dependent on the direction of the strain. And it's uh, determined by how uh, fast the parameter gamma naught changes upon the variation of the distance uh, between the uh, carbon atoms. And we also have the uh, addition uh, to the linear in momentum term uh, in the block which uh, resulted in this trigonal warping. Uh, and uh, here we have the addition which is proportional to the derivative of the parameter gamma 3, uh, of the parameter characterizing the interlayer hopping. And of course, it also depends on the direction of the strain. And uh, this is not a very convenient form to work with, and there is a simplification for this Hamiltonian which can be uh, made by realizing that uh, what stands here looks like uh, a vector potential added to the electron momentum, and if this vector potential is homogeneous, it can be actually eliminated completely uh, from the theory. 
If it's not homogeneous, then one can generate magnetic fields, the huge magnetic fields that uh, Andre mentioned, uh, which would be huge if gradients of uh, such deformation is large. So what we do here, we split uh, the this vector potential, and by the way, this vector potential would have the opposite sign in the opposite values, so that it has nothing really to do with time inversion symmetry breaking. It's purely lattice deformation effect. And then uh, we can split this vector potential into two parts. One would be kind of potential part, and that there would have non-zero rotor, and the one which uh, can be uh, separated into the gradient of some uh, uh, scalar field, this part can be gauged out by this gauge transformation. So that this would eliminate part of uh, the vector potential part of this uh, parameter A node if it depends on the coordinates. And if it would be constant in space, we would get rid of it completely. But now we have to realize that we cannot get rid of A node and A3 simultaneously because they're different. They're coming with different parameters and they're coming uh, from different constants from different couplings, intralayer coupling for A node and intralayer coupling for A3. Therefore, if we perform this gauge transformation, we can eliminate, in uh, the case of homogeneous strain, A node from the antidiagonal part. But then what will happen uh, that it will produce change, but will not eliminate uh, the, uh, the contribution from uh, the strain due to the uh, interlayer hopping. And then what we're going to get, we're going to get uh, a non-zero addition uh, to the uh, linear term in the Hamiltonian uh, in the part which previously was responsible for the trigonal warping. So what it means, it means that for homogeneous strain, we simply move a little bit the uh, Dirac points, the nominal Dirac points, zero for the momentum uh, as we determine now for uh, this pi, for this new pi operator. We move it a little bit away uh, from the exactly brilliant zone corner, and after that the Hamiltonian looks almost exactly the same as it was uh, before we included the strain, except that for in the block which characterizes the low energy part, the low, low energy states, we have a constant term which now has to be uh, taken into account. Uh, and uh, if we project it onto the two-band model, uh, it means that in addition to the uh, combination of quadratic in momentum and linear momentum terms that produce uh, this band structure with a Lifshitz transition at very low energies, we now need to modify it by taking into account some uh, constant uh, addition to the matrix, where these two parameters, w and w star are, is, are, are, so w is a complex number, and real and imaginary parts of this complex number depend on the size and also on the direction of the axis uh, along which we have stretched the structure. So after we do that, we now can uh, uh, draw many uh, pictures and show how the band structure evolves if strain is applied. Uh, but before, uh, it's nice to try to estimate the size of the effect. And here is a, really, a bit of a trouble. Uh, to estimate the size of uh, this W, of the absolute value of W, the absolute value of perturbation we can create in the Hamiltonian, due to a strain of, let's say, 1%, we need to know two parameters. We need to know uh, the logarithmic derivative of constant gamma node with respect to the change in the distance between uh, carbons on the lattice, and also the same for gamma 3. The value of logarithmic derivative gamma node with respect to the interatomic uh, inter distance in a single layer uh, has been post uh, computed in DFT and uh, compared, uh, I would say, determined uh, from the electron phonon coupling uh, measured in Raman. And uh, this value is, uh, is a number we now can use. Uh, but there is nothing known for sure about uh, this parameter. So well, the best we can do is just to say that maybe this parameter is small or maybe it would not cancel here completely the effect of the strain coming from a single layer. And we simply ignore it because we don't know it. And if we just use the parameter we know, we would estimate that the size uh, of this addition to the Hamiltonian, the absolute value of W is about 6 electron volts uh, for, uh, for a strain of about 1%. 
And now you see that this is comparable uh, to the Lifshitz transition energy uh, we discussed before, so that these two, uh, two effects have to be uh, taken uh, together on equal footing, so that if you want to uh, consider even small, uh, small strains, we have to include them uh, if we want to uh, discuss seriously uh, how the Lifshitz transition looks like uh, in, uh, in suspended uh, flame. So I'm going now to show a, a sequence of figures uh, demonstrating how uh, switching on strain in some direction uh, changes the uh, electronic band structure. And the way how I do it, uh, I take real and imaginary part of W. So I don't uh, really relate it directly to the direction of the strain, which we know how to do. Uh, instead, I just follow what happens if you increase uh, the real part of W or decrease the uh, or increase the imaginary part of W. So this is the same as increasing uh, strain uh, with uh, axis uh, which is uh, uh, somehow oriented in uh, on the flake. So this uh, point is uh, uh, corresponds to zero strain, and uh, this is the case when the uh, band structure undergoes Lifshitz transition into four uh, Dirac cones, three offside and one in the middle. So now we uh, start increasing strain in such a way that, let's say, the real part of W becomes uh, positive and becomes larger and larger. And the evolution in the band structure you see here is the following, that the uh, three Dirac points, uh, one in the middle and two offside, would start moving toward each other, merge together, and then become a single Dirac point. So you kind of get a two-leg freak, uh, which is shown on the right-hand side. This is a dispersion which also has the uh, Lifshitz transition built in it because uh, at some energy, when you go from high energies down to lower energies, the uh, single connected Fermi line will split into two parts and you will end up with two Dirac cones. What if we change uh, the strain in such a way that W will, be, uh, will become bigger but uh, negative? So when uh, we move along this axis of real part of W in the opposite direction, what will happen is that this uh, Dirac point in the middle and this offside will start moving toward each other. At some critical value of strain, they would merge, and then uh, they would generate a minimum in the dispersion, local minimum in the dispersion, which will be lifted up higher and higher upon the increase of strain, and then eventually vanish, and will end up with a two-leg dispersion, two Dirac cones left, and the Lifshitz transition, which is now happening at the energy, much higher than it was in unstrained graphene, and uh, with uh, the value of Lifshitz transition energy, and therefore critical density, determined by the size of the strain. What if we uh, change the strain in such a way that a major part of W uh, will uh, increase with a zero uh, real part? Uh, then uh, the other pair of Dirac points will start uh, moving uh, towards each other, this one and that one. Uh, they will eventually merge together at some critical value, uh, create a local minimum in the dispersion, and then this local minimum in the dispersion would again vanish uh, upon increase of the strain, leaving us with uh, two legs uh, of Dirac cones. One uh, is hidden uh, by behind the, uh, the one on the front. And uh, now we can... The angle here tells in what direction it is. So if angle is zero, angle is counted from the x-axis, w is real. But uh, to get... Uh, purely imaginary, uh, well, you have to uh, figure out what angle it should be. 90 degrees, probably. Um, and uh, what uh, is shown here is uh, uh, the whole variety of things you can get. You can get a region of strains, small strains, finite but small, for which you would still have four Dirac cones in the spectrum. Blue indicates the interval of strains, the interval of values W, for which you would have uh, two Dirac cones left, plus an additional minimum, uh, an additional minimum in the dispersion. And red indicates uh, the regime when you uh, have only two Dirac cones left and uh, no uh, local minimum in the dispersion. And what's shown on the right-hand side plot is uh, how this Lifshitz transition looks like in terms of 
uh, the position of one Hof singularity, uh, which uh, is an indication that the uh, electron Fermi energy uh, has passed across uh, the uh, place where the, uh, the uh, in the in the band structure uh, where the uh, single connected Fermi line splits into independent pieces. Each time you pass through the saddle point in the dispersion, and this gives this uh, divergency uh, in the uh, density of states uh, in the system. Uh, then what you can see is that uh, for high energies, this density of states will saturate at a finite value, but for the lower density of states, uh, for the lower energies uh, below the uh, below the uh, uh, Lipschitz transition, you have density of states which uh, rises linearly with the uh, Fermi energy uh, and, uh, well, with, with the electron energy. And this is uh, the manifestation of the linear dispersion you have in those Dirac cones. Uh, now, we know that there are Dirac cones, and we now know how to count Landau levels at zero energy uh, in the spectrum. So what's uh, shown here in the middle of uh, uh, this slide is the uh, sequence of uh, Landau level spectra for uh, three typical strain regimes. The one in the middle, when strain is too small to kill four Dirac points. The red one, which is so large that only two Dirac points are left in the spectrum. And the blue intermediate one, for which the uh, spectrum has two Dirac, point, uh, two Dirac, uh, two Dirac cones and uh, this is the example here, two Dirac cones and, uh, the, uh, and the additional dispersion minimum uh, at uh, some value of the momentum. Uh, and uh, what you see in those uh, uh, panels for the Landau levels, it is that uh, if we go to the lowest magnetic field, then when we have four Dirac cones, we have still this 16 degenerate zero energy Landau level. Uh, when we have only two Dirac cones left, we have only eight uh, degenerate Landau level at zero energy. And uh, this is because if of the, each of these two Dirac cones will give us four Landau levels due to the spin and valley degeneracy. And uh, uh, now we can say what in the case of such a strong strain uh, would be the, uh, uh, what, what, what would be the uh, longest living uh, quantum Hall effect state or Shubnikov de Gaza oscillation if we start uh, going into lower density and structures where such filling factor would be realized uh, at, uh, at a lower magnetic field. Uh, for the case when we have spectra with a pair of Dirac cones, the, the filling factors which would be the strongest survivals would be filling factor plus four and minus four instead of plus eight and minus eight as we discussed. Uh, about the, uh, the uh, non-strained uh, material. Uh, and there is a very interesting feature that uh, appears in intermediate strains, uh, which is that uh, you see that there is a slando level that we're following from high fields down to the lowest field. And uh, first the slando level was evolving linearly with magnetic field, and then it started to saturate, 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 and then it gets saturated. And it has energy which is almost independent of the magnetic field. And this is Landau level, which got stuck in this dispersion minimum. And therefore, it cannot drop down when we start decreasing and decreasing magnetic field. Eventually, Landau levels in this legs would drop down on the energy scale because their dependence on the magnetic field is square root of magnetic field. But there is a finite interval for which the excitation uh, from, the, uh, from the zero Landau level to the next one uh, would have the energy which uh, is almost field independent. So you can say that activation energy in this quantum Hall effect state of filling factor four uh, would first go down then get saturated before it quickly drops down to zero. Whereas for all the other filling factors, the activation energy in the quantum Hall effect would in this regime would be already so small that you would not expect uh, the quantum Hall effect to survive. Okay, so I'm now going to uh, the uh, next item on my agenda. And I would like to discuss what happens uh, if uh, the uh, bilayer would be suspended, cleaned, very homogeneous, but not strained. And what I would like to uh, describe is the uh, pneumatic phase transition, pneumatic phase of electrons which can form uh, in such a nice 
uh, nicely prepared uh, bilayer graphene. This would be uh, the effect which would develop intrinsically in the system, and therefore it would not depend on the history of the device, and it would be the same in a number of devices uh, which can be studied either uh, in one go in, 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 in uh, or a number of pieces of flake which can be studied in a single device or several flakes studied in different devices. So first of all, what is, uh, what is a dynamatic uh, phase transition? Uh, the pneumatic phase transition in the electronic liquid has been introduced by uh, Aganisian, Kivelsen, and Fratkin. Uh, and uh, this is the transition in the electronic liquid which mimics the effect of unilateral deformation of the crystal. It does not come from the deformation of the crystal. It, uh, it is the uh, transition which happens with the electrons. It may then generate very small deformation of the crystal itself, crystal itself which uh, would be difficult to detect uh, using uh, crystallography because that would depend on the strength of the coupling between electrons uh, and the lattice deformations. And if lattice is very rigid, then uh, for electrons it would be very difficult to uh, change the lattice uh, substantially so that this would lead to observable uh, change in, 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 uh, in X-ray scattering. Uh, and uh, this pneumatic phase transition has been uh, recently claimed uh, in uh, iron-based superconductors. And it has not been seen, uh, as far as I know, anywhere else. Uh, so what we found by doing the renormalization group analysis of interactions of graphene, it is that the transition mimicking the effect of lattice deformation is actually the most plausible phase transition uh, in, uh, in bilayer graphene. Uh, so how uh, the story developed, uh, there were many suggestions of what kind of phase transition can happen in bilayers at zero magnetic field. The case of a strong magnetic field was uh, quite a clear cut because in the strong magnetic fields you have very high degeneracy of Landau levels. If you know uh, well, you have the uh, eightfold degenerate Landau level at zero energy, uh, you know what's the degeneracy, you know what are the quantum numbers, you know electrons interact by Coulomb interaction, and then uh, there are uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, natural suspects for the symmetry breaking uh, to discuss the valley uh, uh, polarization and spin polarization of the electrons due to the electron exchange interaction. For bilayers at zero magnetic field, the story is not such a clear cut, and it's much more difficult uh, to do the analysis uh, because uh, the, uh, the uh, spectrum of electrons is continuous, and uh, there were several uh, predictions which uh, have been made by assuming or by liking this or that kind of the phase transition. Uh, the, there was a prediction of an electric excitonic insulator state by Levitov and McDonald. Uh, there was prediction of a magnetic state, and there was discussion of some more complicated phases. How would you find out theoretically which of the phase transition should happen? not to suggest that it may happen if the interaction constant in the corresponding channel of uh, fluctuations in the electronic system uh, would be the strongest. The way to answer this question is to analyze the interactions between electrons, between fluctuations in the electronic system breaking all possible symmetries uh, uh, of the crystalline lattice, finding this interaction constants by doing the randomization group analysis, finding them for electrons at low energies. And then if we see that one of the constants grows the fastest when we go from high energies down to the low energies, then this will tell us that this uh, is the channel in which uh, interaction would lead to a phase transition. And what we found is that this channel of the interaction, uh, it actually is the one which leads to the pneumatic phase, pneumatic phase transition uh, mimicking the effect of unilateral strain. So now I'm going to scare off all the experimentalists in the audience, so I, I ask for forgiveness. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I'll try to impress on you that we actually did some calculation. So what, uh, uh, what we did? First of all, we had to uh, formalize the description. 
the way to formalize a description starts uh, with the uh, group theory. So we first of all need to understand uh, what are all the irreducible representations of the symmetry group of the Honeycomb lattice. And for each of the irreducible representations, we can attribute fluctuations in the electronic liquid which break the symmetry according to this irreducible representation. And an interaction between fluctuations which have the same symmetry is characterized by the corresponding constant. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. And we don't know any of those constants before we do the calculation. The only thing we know is that there is a strong Coulomb interaction between electron charges, which is the most symmetric and does not break any symmetry at all. So the way to do the calculation is the following. Starting from what we know and assuming that those symmetry breaking interactions were so small that we would not even possibly bother about their initial values, to find out how the Coulomb interaction between electrons that we know how to describe at the short range scale would then, uh, sorry, uh, at the short range scale would then, and at high energies across the entire band structure, how this would trigger and produce interactions which start breaking the symmetry in the system. So this is a weird way to write down the Hamiltonian using these matrices which act on the uh, direct products of matrices which act on the uh, sublattice components of the uh, electron states and also which act on the Valley components. And we need to do that because if we want to uh, check whether or not there is some phase transition into a charge density state uh, which would then oscillate in space uh, with the vector of the brilliant zone corner, uh, then we need to uh, take into account also everything about the uh, Valley structure of the electron wave functions. Then how the uh, analysis is done? Well, first of all, we know that Coulomb interaction is there. We know that it is strong. And we know that when we have strong interaction, strong Coulomb interaction in metals, the first thing you should do is to screen it. So that's what we do. This uh, wavy line, the thick wavy line, uh, is the screen Coulomb interaction, which we screen uh, using the uh, random phase uh, approximation. And uh, then magic happens. From a strong interaction, we immediately get a weak interaction in which the weakness is controlled by a parameter 1 over n, where n is the number of electron species uh, in graphene. n is equal to 4 because we have one quantum number for valley and one num quantum number for spin. So we have four different species uh, of electrons that participate in screening. And the more species of electrons you have, the stronger screening is, and the weaker the final interaction will be after it is screened. So we take this screened interaction, and then we use 1 over n as a small parameter and do 1 over n expansion. And by now, we can do it to higher orders than we did initially uh, so that we know how to control uh, the perturbation theory analysis of the renormalization of the interaction constants uh, in all symmetry breaking channels. So this process of renormalization requires uh, the uh, perturbation theory analysis of what happens uh, with the interaction. So this, uh, this uh, dashed line characterizes interaction between electrons, between fluctuations in the uh, electron liquid uh, which break symmetry uh, in corresponding to one of the irreducible representations. And uh, this delta states that this is the change in the interaction constant if we uh, eliminate from the consideration electrons uh, in some interval of high energies, uh, reducing the band within which we describe the electrons down and down until we reach the low energy scale uh, at which we expect uh, some interesting physics related to electronic phase transition to take place. And there are many diagrams which one has to take care of. One has to renormalize properly the single particle weight uh, of the electron states not to make uh, mistakes. And uh, what uh, else uh, is included here, uh, the, thick, uh, uh, the, the, the full circles characterize the symmetry breaking interactions and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, gray circle, uh, it characterizes the uh, screened uh, Coulomb interaction. And what you see here, uh, and actually now I, I, I would like to turn to the next slide, what you see here is that 
uh, for the symmetry breaking interactions, uh, the purely Coulomb interaction is able to do something. It's able to create a symmetry breaking interaction between two electrons in the second order in the uh, screened Coulomb interaction. And all this comes from the sublattice structure of the electronic wave functions. So those uh, lines with arrows are green functions of the electrons which know everything about the sublattice structure of the plane wave states of electrons uh, in bilayer graphene. And what you see here is that there is a pair of diagrams which in fact does not cancel and uh, which gives a finite contribution towards one of the uh, symmetry breaking interaction channels. It doesn't give contribution to all of them, it gives the contribution only to one. And what it means, it means that just the structure of the lattice, the structure of the electronic states on the lattice plus Coulomb interaction is able to generate some symmetry breaking, some interaction between symmetry breaking fluctuations in the electronic liquid, but not between all of them, only between one time. So this has been noticed by Wafik and Young, uh, uh, earlier than uh, we completed our work. And uh, uh, the difference between uh, Wafik and Young's paper and ours is that we took into account all possible interaction channels, and as a result, we had to work a little bit longer than uh, Wafik, uh, who took only three interaction constants into account at the very beginning. And uh, before we uh, were able to complete our work, uh, predictions of the other phase of the uh, phase uh, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, excitonic, uh, fer ferroelectric excitonic insulator has appeared uh, due to uh, Levitov and his student. And uh, here is an example of, uh, uh, of that. Uh, if uh, one misses some diagrams, one may end up with very strange predictions. For example, they uh, initially calculated everything just using one diagram of uh, this big zoo, and they have discovered that there is some huge renormalization, which is not even logarithmic, which is log square, uh, which means that uh, uh, the phase transition they predicted would happen at uh, much higher temperatures that actually anything can, uh, can happen in real life. And then they found that uh, if one includes uh, two diagrams into consideration, uh, then uh, this log square cancels out only logarithmic correction appears. And uh, uh, as you may see here, uh, this uh, two diagrams, they appear in the analysis only if there is already something in the, already some finite interaction constant uh, present in the system so that it can further increase, but it cannot be generated if it's not there. In contrast to this pair of diagrams which produce interaction is one of the symmetry breaking channels, uh, which uh, is triggered only by most symmetric Coulomb interaction. So the, this slide is the last one uh, which uh, should scare experimentalists. This uh, horrendous uh, line uh, describes the renormalization group uh, theory equations uh, for all uh, interaction constant I mentioned at the beginning. And what you see here is that uh, to renormalize one of the constants, which breaks the symmetry, which corresponds to the interaction between symmetry breaking fluctuations in the electronic liquid, to get it renormalized, to get it increased, you need it to be already there. And it is true for all the constants except for one. And this is a constant which corresponds to the symmetry breaking from the irreducible representation uh, E2 of the symmetry group of the crystal. And this is a representation which describes the violation of symmetry when you displace one sublattice with respect to the other, or when you stretch the lattice in uh, one direction. And then if we just threw away all the other constants which need to be finite to get renormalized and take only the one uh, which uh, is triggered by the Coulomb interaction, then uh, we solve the uh, single RG equation for a single parameter, and then uh, we find uh, at what energy scale the interaction constant becomes of the order of one. And in this energy scale, we should expect that the system is no more stable, the symmetric electronic liquid is no more stable, that it develops uh, the phase which uh, mimics the effect of the uniaxial strain. 
So what uh, is this phase? This phase is parameterized by the order parameter, which has two components. Uh, it is similar to a director in pneumatic liquid. So it looks like a vector, but if you employ inversion, this vector would not change. And in terms of the way how this uh, perturbation, so how this order parameter appears in the electron Hamiltonian, it is exactly the same way as uh, the uh, strain uh, changes the Hamiltonian. And it can be parameterized using exactly the same parameter W as I described uh, in, in, in the case of uh, artificially strained uh, bilayer. So what this transition does, it mimics the effect of unilateral strain with all the observable consequences I described before. First of all, you will have the density of states varied uh, as a function of energy in such a way that there will be some Lifshitz transition. Uh, and upon the phase transition, you can get the state in which the dispersion will have an additional minimum uh, in the dispersion. And of course, all the uh, characteristics related to quantum Hall effect or Shubnikov de Gaza oscillations. Uh, for example, that the uh, filling factor four uh, for the asymmetric state, for the asymmetric phase, uh, should be the most stable uh, filling factor of low magnetic fields in contrast to filling factor eight for the uh, symmetric crystal, it still uh, stands. Uh, so these are the predictions. Uh, the question is what uh, one can see in the experiment. And here I'm showing the uh, results that uh, are not yet published, uh, which are due to the Manchester group. Uh, so what uh, the top panel, uh, what, sorry, what the bottom panel in this slide shows is the uh, effective density of thermally excited carriers, electrons plus holes, uh, in uh, gra monolayer graphene at exactly zero carrier density. And uh, you can understand that uh, if we increase the temperature in the system, we create electron hole pairs, just taking electrons from the valence band and putting them in the uh, states in the conduction band. And uh, this quadratic dependence of the number of the electrons uh, that are thermally, electrons and holes, which are thermally excited, uh, this quadratic dependence reflects the linear dependence of the electron density of states. Linear dependence gives quadratic dependence in the number of effective carriers uh, because you take the density of states integrated over energy up to the temperature, and then from linear dependence you get quadratic. In the bilayer, if you look at the high energy range, then you see linear dependence of the effective carrier density on the temperature, which you should attribute to the constant density of states uh, for a quadratic spectrum. But then if you look in more details what happens at low temperatures, and this is what's happening here, then you see that this linear dependence gets turned and it starts being more similar to what you see in the singular, indicating that something happened uh, to the density of states of electrons at low energies. It got reduced as compared to what you would expect uh, in the case of just a simple parabola. Uh, even more. One can look at the, uh, at the quantum hole effect, the Shubnik of the gas oscillations. And uh, there is already one published result uh, by uh, Jacobi's group, uh, which uh, has demonstrated that uh, the filling factor four uh, is the most persistent down to the lowest magnetic field. And uh, uh, also, the same thing has been seen in the samples studied at Manchester, except for one thing in Manchester they had different devices. And in Manchester, uh, they uh, measured the activation energies for this uh, filling factor four and also for the other filling factors very carefully. So just for uh, your, to guide your eye, I collected the predictions for uh, the behavior of the activation energy and Landau levels and the dispersion uh, for pneumatic phase uh, and also for strained bilayer graphene, in which there is very particular regime I mentioned in the middle of the talk, when the phase, uh, sorry, when the band structure uh, of uh, bilayer has uh, two legs of dispersion cones plus a local minimum, uh, which was the result of that two dispersion cones, two Dirac points came together, kind of recombined, split apart, and produced this local minimum in the dispersion. And for that case, we identified that 
uh, there is a Landau level at intermediate magnetic fields which gets stuck. Uh, 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 its, its, its magnetic field dependence gets stuck. It gets saturated. And uh, in terms of the excitation energy of the quantum Hall effect, uh, this means that the activation energy of filling factor four, which would be the most persistent uh, filling factor in the quantum Hall effect measurements, would uh, also get saturated before it eventually drops down. And if you look at uh, those diagrams, uh, which are the result of the experiment analysis of the experiment, you see that this is exactly what is happening. Now, the last question you may ask about this experiment is, whether what has been observed was a result of a strain or it was a result of some intrinsic event like uh, the pneumatic phase forming in the bilayer. And uh, there is a strong feeling uh, on Kostya's side that it was uh, the intrinsic effect in the bilayer because the same activation energy dependence on the magnetic field has been seen not in one sample but in many samples. And it would be difficult to imagine that samples which have different history of preparation would have exactly the same value of the strain in post. But if it would be the intrinsic event, if it would be the phase transition which happens inside the high quality bilayer by itself, then obviously it would be exactly the same, uh, exactly the same in all different structures. And the last thing I would like to mention about this phase transition is that by the nature of the symmetry breaking uh, by this uh, order parameter, by the director, and by the nature of the uh, honeycomb lattice, by the nature of the uh, symmetry group uh, of symmetry, which is broken by this pneumatic order transition, this phase transition has to be of the first order. It is not a phase transition that continuously develops. It happens, and then you get a new system with a prescribed spectrum, like in the ferromagnetic, uh, uh, not like in ferromagnetic phase transition, but like in, uh, in the uh, phase transitions uh, when you crystallize a liquid and then you get a crystal with all fixed parameters. So that if this phase transition would take place, then the band structure which uh, electrons will have at low energy scale in the bilayer would be always the same independently of the details how the sample has been prepared. Just you need to make uh, the sample uh, clean enough uh, and uh, with the homogeneous carrier density. So that there is a very strong case that uh, the uh, bilayers are the second uh, system uh, in which pneumatic phase of electronic liquid uh, does exist. In addition to, uh, uh, to uh, nictites. And this is my last transparency, and these are the conclusions. All right, questions, please. So the, the question was whether perpendicular electric field, which we need to apply to, to assess some finite concentration is strong enough to open the gap. Okay, the answer is not. It's not strong enough. You make a simple estimate distance and what is in the land. You go to microvolt regime opening the gap instead of four milli electron volts or something. What you see on this picture? So you you, you notice that the range of magnetic field is, is very small. It's not like in, 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 in your uh, measurements with the same range of filling factors when you had tens of Tesla, or 10 Tesla, or 20 Tesla. In those diagrams, I, I have to say I switched off, OK? I, it immediately reminded me yesterday's talk of Fidena Fulis, OK? Uh, uh, dinner talk, OK? So I did notice the diagrams which would be responsible for renormalization of the Fermi velocity. Fermi velocity, you don't have Fermi velocity anymore. It's parabolic no, dispersion. Uh, at the Dirac cones, at very so low what, concentrations. Yeah, so what we did, we, we, we also studied renormalization of the effective mass and the renormalization of V3 as well. Yeah. So Vs3. we renormalize them. Yeah, we renormalize them. But, as but well. there were no bubble diagrams. We, okay, yeah. So you, you think the phenomena of renormalization of V3 
automatically contain the effects of uh, renormalization. We, 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 did, we, did, we did include uh, V3 and the mass in the renormalization group analysis. So we know how they get renormalized, and very little. Okay. Numerical factors are such that the mass and V3 uh, renormalize very, very little. They, it's just weird thing about uh, prefactors. Um, so you, you can forget about their changes. But that's what we do when we go from high energies down to the energies where the phase transition takes place. After a phase transition takes place, and you get this linear dispersions, the analysis of what would be happening at the lowest energies with the uh, dispersion on those lengths, which actually is also anisotropic, would require a separate step in the RG procedure, which has nothing to do with whether or not phase transition takes place. That would characterize details of this dispersion if one would be able to investigate them further. Shouldn't be done self-consistently. No, 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 no. There is no need for that. Would um, the temperature dependence help you distinguish between the just the strain effect and and your pneumatic phase transition? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I would say that uh, the phase transition would, uh, uh, would be killed by temperature. So if you heat it up, it, it goes. So that would really distinguish it from the, the strain effect? Yes, except for one thing. How would, what, what would you measure to distinguish? Because both measurements that I described relied on variation of the temperature. So if you look at this temperature dependence, then the change in the, uh, in the behavior may be also that at higher temperatures we, we had this uh, linear dependence uh, just because uh, parabolic spectrum and no phase transition at all yet. Lower down temperature, phase transition happened, and then we, uh, we got uh, uh, in the energy range where we have linear dispersion due to those two uh, Dirac cones form. So that, that, that's not easy because in all these measurements, information is extracted from the temperature dependence. Uh, the possibility may be in, in doing the uh, carrier density dependence. But then for this kind of measurements, it, it, it's not easy because then uh, the uh, clear cut of what you call the effective density uh, would be not so clear. Thank you. At one point, you showed density of states, those little peaks in the density of states due to, the, I think, the saddle points earlier just due to the strain effect. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there. What's the uh, so energy, this, energy scale? I remind you, this is homogeneous strain. This is homogeneous strain. Homogeneous, like a... So you, 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 you take, you take uh, a long uh, flake. Oh this shape, you stretch it, then forget about what's happening close to the end, look in the middle. Okay. Or you take a very wide, like, like that, and then stretch it, look in the middle, not near the top and bottom edge. And, and so these little peaks in the density of states, were, what are the energies like, that they should appear? What, what, so what's the, the energy the, scale? So yeah. the energy where a peak appears depends on the strain. So the higher the strain, the farther to higher energies you move the okay, one called singularity. Please so this, give me, see, this please give me numbers. Here. <laughs> hmm? So in, in terms of energy, okay. uh, e, e star so is uh, of the order of one millilectron volt. Millivolt, so one, one millivolt. Yeah. So the scale is here, uh, E star is about one millivolt. We, we, we had to normalize it here to the uh, to the unit of uh, uh, Lifshitz transition energy in the unperturbed bilayer. <laughs> so if you can create a homogeneous strain uh, with few percent, uh, you would be able to see this at the scale of uh, 10 milli electron volts. That 1 is percent accessible. is 6. 
Um, if you put on a strain, um, it's going to obviously affect the geometry around, and therefore you're going to get a, quite a big columbic repulsion because uh, you're going to get, as you strain this, you're going to stretch this, you're going to change the bond angles in your crystal. So yeah, and th this, this is the fact that we yeah. take into account. The, the hopping uh, between yeah. the sides has changed. Now, if, 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 if that's the case, that's going to actually put a lot of energy into the system, isn't it? If you well, like. when you because when you strain, you're, when you're you actually put basic, energy, because you're basically you're pushing those electron, if you like, your electron um, wave functions together, you're going to get a repulsion. A well, the, 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 the first thing which uh, you have to do is to overcome the directionality of bonds prescribed by sp2 hybridization, yeah. which has nothing to do with the pi orbitals we no, discussed no, here. But just, just and to do that, you need to put a lot of energy. Yeah, that's the point I was making. Yes. Was, right. You spent some time uh, explaining uh, how you got this quite elegant uh, Hamiltonian including strain with gauge transformation and things. Can you do it uh, from looking on your at your original uh, Hamiltonian and using methods of invariance or things? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's uh, that's what you would do if you just yeah. If you just look uh, at this and if you. If you go to the last slide, yeah, if you go to the last slide here and say that uh, if we have broken the uh, symmetry from C3V to C2V, then it is permit it would be characterized by a director, and then you implement this director, which belongs to E2 uh, irreducible representation of the symmetry group into like Hamiltonian. This or just uh, putting components of uh, your strain in the places of some components of your momentum, like Latin, Latin did or Picus, putting strains in uh, holes Hamiltonians. Yes. But uh, uh, since you have this picture here, uh, you have this one half singularity with a negative mass. It's known that for other 4 by 4 Hamiltonians, uh, it is used for having um, kind of emission of terahertz uh, radiation, because you have a cyclotron mass somewhere which is negative, which gives you instead of cyclotron absorption. Kind Thank of you for this question. Yesterday night, Avoris almost convinced me not to give this talk today, because he gave uh, a fiery speech yesterday night. You, you, you are not there, because that was only for uh, invited speakers. Uh, and he said, we scientists, we have to do only research that will improve competitiveness of American industry against Chinese, <laughs> Koreans, and whoever else. And he talked about it and convinced me that what I'm doing is absolutely useless, and I shouldn't give the talk in the morning. The only reason I came actually here. I, I felt responsible for obligations. But uh, now, thank you very much. So now, you see, uh, if I don't I, I do something useful. <laughs> so you can take bilayer, you can strain it, and whatever you need to do, you will generate, uh, is it terahertz? Yeah. yeah, it will be terahertz, 10 mil electron volts. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm going to go back to the maybe first slide that you had early on. You don't have to bring it up. But uh, when first. you start with uh, Slanzuski vice you have certain overlap integrals and yeah. so on. And we have values for those. Uh, when you have a strain, uh, they're going to change. And uh, uh, some of the symmetry that, you, that was orig originally put into Slanzuski vice will be reduced. So you'll have a representation that splits. Mm -hmm. And you know what that is because you worked it out. It's C2, it's not C6. Yeah. Uh, so can you go back and uh, now that you've done the calculation yeah. and you know which level, because they don't all get so uh, much perturbed. It's just a, a couple that you said. 
not all the um, uh, overlap integrals are strongly affected. I, that's what I got from your talk. I'm not sure that that was correct. So, uh, if so you what? could uh, tell the experimentalists a little bit in terms of the original Hamiltonian, which we already know, and we have values for, then some terms will not be changed much, and maybe enough other terms will be, but we can go and find out with a particular stretch uh, those terms and how they've changed and give you the changed parameters under a certain amount of stress. Yeah, so that, that's the point I, I was trying to make when I... Uh, Oh, I didn't uh, get that clearly. When, 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 when I wanted to, to say how big is the fact, let's say, of 1% of strength. Yeah, you, you told so us, what, but so, I, yeah, like Yeah, so what, so what we know, we know the absolute values of gamma node, gamma 3, and gamma 1 very well. Now, the change of gamma 1 will not produce any qualitative effect, so I don't even bother about it. Uh, the change of gamma node and gamma 3 related to the lower symmetry will result in, in, this additional, in this additional perturbation in the Hamiltonian, which will change the band structure. So what do we know uh, in, in this expression? We know pretty well from DFT and from Raman the value of the, of, we have information about how a gamma node changes with the change of the distance between carbon atoms. So that, that, that's what uh, is very solid. We don't know how gamma 3 changes. There is no optical experiment which allowed to extract it. Uh, at least I, I don't know any of those. Uh, for bilayers. For bulk graphite, but graphite there is some for bulk graphite, we tried to extract this information and we struggled with two points. The, the interlayer separation is slightly different and this may actually change the value of this logarithmic derivative. And second, uh, the, the measurement itself, I, I, I wasn't sure I understand what's the, uh, what the process of extraction of the parameter was. Uh. Uh, but so I, 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 I'm saying I don't know what this parameter is. I don't want to claim it's very. Really. Uh, which, that, that ratio, change of log gamma, th that's your new parameter. Yeah, that's a parameter that we don't know. That you don't know. Yeah. So uh, you can turn it in the, in the uh, following I, I way. We, I we know another, this. So another a, a question yeah. related to that, and then I'll shut up. Uh, it, uh, in Slanzuski wise there, there's a difference between the valence band and, and conduction band, a, a level, Landau level separation. And under strain, that should change. And maybe uh, not symmetrically. Uh, uh, so my question is, does it change symmetrically or not symmetrically? Uh, we're talking about very, uh, so let me go back uh, That would to be the about the same size as changes in gamma three, which yeah. is what you- So what, no, what, what I'm saying is that we're talking about very low energy scale. So this uh, electron hole asymmetry is quadratic in the electron momentum. So it, it would be noticeable if we would look at small changes in the energies of Landau levels and high magnetic fields. But in this part of the momentum space, uh, quantitatively, this is very little. Okay, so you've answered my question. So,